A big thank you to Factor, America's number one ready-to-eat meal kit, for supporting the episode this week. Head to factormeals.com slash addition50 and use code addition50 to get 50% off. That's code addition50 at factormeals.com slash addition50 to get 50% off. Hello and welcome to the edition podcast as ever. I'm your host Charlotte Henry and we're doing one of my favourite kind of shows this week, The Meta Show, the podcast where I talk about podcasting. Uh, There's no one better to do this with than the team from Sounds Profitable, who, if you've read some of my newsletters, I often cite their data because they do fantastic research into the world of podcasting. And I'm joined by one of the people in that team, Brian Balletta. Hello, Brian. How are you? I'm great. Thank you so much for having me. I'm thrilled to have you. We didn't get to meet when we were actually in the same place in the same city because you were being too busy being a rock star at the Sounds Profitable <laughs> at the uh, London podcast show. But we, we had a great time there. It showed one of the things I really want to pick up on, just the positivity of podcasting. Yeah, I, I think that that event is such a beacon for our industry now. I mean, it's two uh, two years deep. It happened earlier in this year where it's been a tough media year, not just mm-hmm. podcasting, but media overall. And the outpouring of people interested in the business of podcasting was was really staggering. And I think for the U.S. audience, which we need to be fair that a lot of the revenue for podcasting today originates from the U.S., so a lot of the opinions about podcasting originate Mm -hmm. in the U.S., like the business side opinions, whether they're right or wrong. But it was pretty humbling for, I would say, the U.S. audience to go over to London, realize that there are authoritative people across multiple countries and regions and get to learn from them instead of kind of all just talk to ourselves a little bit. Yeah, there was a real sense of people from around the world really wanting to be in that space, which was pretty amazing. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the thing that I've learned the most in the last three years of starting to go to European conferences is that you guys leave on the last day. Like if it ends at four o'clock, people are on 430 trains out. There's no hanging around afterwards. <laughs> and that's so that's been very interesting for me. Uh, yeah, we well, you've got to get back, got to be efficient. And um, that was quite funny. <laughs> actually, yeah, I know it was great to hear you and your colleague Tom Webster speaking. Uh, but there's a whole bunch of stuff we've got to get into. And one thing actually highlighted by that conference and often highlighted by the Sounds Profitable research is, well, those of us in podcasting and who love podcasts, both as creators and consumers, assume everyone is listening to loads of podcasts. And your data consistently show that that's not the case. And I, to me, that's exciting because I think it shows, and I've written about this, that there is so many more people for podcasts of all kinds to reach oh i completely agree with you yeah i mean the what's been really fun about digging into this stuff and tom really kind of coined our view on the three waves of podcasting right we have people who are here for the medium obsessed about the format the free distribution all that people who are here for a show serial beat like is is a killer example oh, well done that. we got through two and a half minutes without mentioning serial that's good no we've done well <laughs> Hey, look, I think that's, I think we hit a goal there. Um, But, but then we have people here for an episode, right? Like there are people who listen, like my mom, thanks for listening, mom, will listen to everything that says my name on it, right? She'll basically, she's got Google alerts for it, or people will search for specific topics. Those are the people we, we've yet to grab, right? Those are the people that like book publishing and other categories of media creation have like really leaned into, right? People trying to find the answer to one thing and they Mm. bury it into a book. They might not want your whole series. They might not follow you forever. They might not be the type of person who makes their personality books, but we haven't captured those people yet. So there's tons of opportunity. Yeah. And of course, the joy of podcasting, as you're laying that out, I'm thinking, yeah, but there's so many great podcasts about books. Why aren't they enjoying books and also listening to book podcasts? Because there's some fabulous ones. Uh, and it's interesting you also say making it part of their personality because most people don't make, oh, I watch TV shows, their personality, or I even listen to music on the radio. Although obviously music is a big part of people's personality. That's a slightly different thing. But the idea that people are podcast people or not podcast people is a kind of funny one, isn't it? 
Oh, so I don't know if I'd, I'd agree with that necessarily. Like, so uh-huh. my wife has read like, I think 19 books last month, 19 books. Like yeah, I might've read. Yep. Mm-hmm. She Have just it. burns through them and she I has such a time. fun time with it. Yeah. I, I don't, I think I finished one audio book and I think it was, beca- <laughs> it was, um, it was a uh, silo because we watched the TV show yeah. and I was like, no, I gotta know what's going on. Um, so that's and like books are her, her personality. She posts about it every month. Yeah. And then music. My brother is is a is a manager in a band. He is really it, for him. His Instagram and everything he shares is like here's a new band. Here's a new artist. Here's someone I think you should check out. And it's really cool. It is his personality. And um, like don't let's not talk. Forget about people who love like the Real Housewives or Bachelorette <laughs> or things like that. That that's a big part for them. You know, it's been a bit since we've had must-see TV style stuff, right? That every everybody's like f- gathering around, but even succession. So I don't I don't know, but I, I do think it I, I do think we're a little bit harder on ourselves that it's a little bit nerdier to be into podcasting. But I think that that's I I don't know. I don't think it's a bad thing. No. And I guess people maybe as they get on and podcast hosts have got much better at this making their community uh, being part of their podcast listening community i think so even if you're not listening to loads of podcasts you might make listen to a certain show is important to you yeah i'm I'm part of two discords for two different uh shows that that i support on patreon and i like the community aspect there sometimes they do live listens and commentary with the cast and it's just it's so compelling to be part of a group of people it's like being at a live show virtually yeah and and there's so much going on and again there's a lot of data that come out from you guys at Sam Profitor I should point out uh you're a research organization you work with all sorts of companies to produce regular research on the podcast industry you're not really doing the kind of this show is up this show is down you're looking at the business side and really diving very deep into it I mean some of the stuff you you focus a lot on ad tech and how that works Mm -hmm. and what that's doing for the industry and it's it's really deep dive stuff but one thing that we should talk about is Spotify's role in this world uh because it's grown it's growing I find it quite funny that uh YouTube has now got a podcast section and Spotify now has a video section yeah (laughs) yeah we'll see who eats the other one first right yeah seriously uh of course, you and I could have a whole different conversation about the steps back as well that Spotify has made in the actual original content side of things. That's a whole almost different conversation. But one thing Spotify has done really well from very early on is that ad tech side, isn't it? It's got the megaphone network. It's got uh, dynamic ad tech insertion as well. It's got it really nailed that technology down before it made the content in a way, didn't it? I would say so. I mean, you know, Megaphone powered a lot of what Spotify did from the start and uh, helped them create their ability to do streaming ads. So most of podcast ads are inserted either host read or they're dynamically inserted by the hosting platform, whereas Spotify worked with Megaphone to build the ability for the app itself to make the ad call and display the ad separately from the content, which is really cool. I think Spotify really advanced the technology in our space and worked with some amazing providers and and it's acquired nothing but home run technology across the board. I think where Spotify kind of took an aggressive stance was on content. And I, I think they advanced us three to five years. I think they answered a question that we would have dragged through for the next three to five years is, can a podcast app be like a video streaming app? Am I going to tolerate having Amazon Prime and Netflix and Disney Plus and Hulu and all these separate apps in podcasting like I will in streaming or is podcasting like a web browser where if I use Chrome and you tell me I can't use Chrome for this website, I might not use this website. And that's, I think, what we learned. Well, aside from the ads, the kind of exclusive content side of things with Spotify is very interesting because I think you're right that actually people don't want multiple podcast apps. They, They have a place where they subscribe to their shows and that's it. Um, back back to the ad tech side a bit. Megaphone. Now, correct me if I'm wrong at any of these points. Spotify acquired Megaphone, right? It didn't build it yep. proprietary, but it is now its software. But also, it licenses it and collaborates with people to you who else who can also use the Megaphone technology to get their ads as well. So I heard a really interesting conversation 
uh, at that London podcast show between the BBC and Spotify who are working together on this kind of thing. Um, I've got that right, haven't it? That is, they don't hold yeah, it, me- just proprietary. Correct. Megaphone is a hosting platform, just like all the other enterprise hosting platforms out there. They allow you to distribute your content. There absolutely could be people that are on Megaphone that choose to not have their podcast on Spotify if they wanted to. There's no obligation, but enterprise partners usually want to be everywhere. And the ad technology works uh, across all of RSS, but Megaphone has been rolling out in beta the ability for publishers to test the streaming ad insertion themselves. And also through their Spotify ad network, which is their additional sales support that they provide, whether on RSS or on the app, they are able to sell both of those formats uh, across all of the partners who opt in. Do you think this commitment to ad tech is actually helping Spotify compete with the likes of Apple, who for most people, they think, oh, I've got an iPhone. For many people, I know there's more Android phones in the world, but for lots of people, it's I've got an iPhone. I use that. There's a podcast out there. That's where I listen to podcasts. But suddenly Spotify is really swinging big at this. And I think that ad tech kind of play is part of it. I think it really matters. Yeah, I think ad tech allows you to do quite a bit. I mean, we're seeing retail, uh, like retail stores. I think Kroger just built their own <laughs> um, entire ad stack or is, or is building right now. And that's kind of wild, right? That we're looking at these media companies that have no technology getting technology. Spotify is an app that you sign into to use. You have to give some information there so they don't have to worry as much about mobile device IDs or cookies. They don't have to worry about IP degradation or anything like that. They know you, right? You gave them info and said this is my account and as you go further into it you have to give them more and consent to more so i think that tech not just in podcasting can help them shape their mind and shape their services around music advertising which is huge and they they're they're a massive chunk of it you mean with the free accounts that people do Yep. Yeah, because to to use the app on your phone with the free account, you still need uh you need, still need to log in. To sure. use it on the web, I don't know if you need to log in the same way, but that's you know those are some of the interesting aspects here. So I think ad technology, I think a lot of media became ad supported. I mean, we saw Netflix roll out an ad supported solution. We saw Disney Plus mm-hmm. and all these other partners start to offer it. So having full control of that in your walled garden is an incredibly attractive yes and one day we might even know how many people are seeing ads on netflix and disney plus one day yeah i mean look at at the end of the day the the transparency the transparency for all of it's a headache right like the the lack of having access to that publicly um uh, frustrates a lot of people but the problem just becomes that uh, the, these walled gardens need to keep something back for themselves. It's something unique about them. They're not participating in the open ecosystem the same way. And if they're big enough, they get away with it to a degree. But when they get too big, like Google, people start investigating and we find problems with the stuff. Yeah. So I I don't know. I, I'm excited to see how it works. I think that more opportunities to make money for podcasters is incredibly critical. But I think that we're going to continue to see more of a walled garden from Spotify in that even while they put their content everywhere, because truthfully, their ad sales team and their technical capabilities are better when it works everywhere and like melding the two together than it is to just silo it into just the app. It's interesting because a lot of their original content play was about trying to make you have a Spotify account and use the Spotify app. Uh, I think we've heard, both of us have heard stories about how Bill Simmons, who is very senior in the kind of podcast team and as an exec at Spotify, but also obviously founded The Ringer and has yeah. those hosts those very successful shows. He has always been very keen about the kind of open nature of podcasts and just have the shows everywhere. But there were times where Spotify kind of wobbled on that, that, you, you know, at the beginning, you could only listen to Joe Rogan, for is the obvious example, on Spotify. Yeah. I think that, well, but I, but I think that they forced us, like this is what I was talking about with the three to five years of advancement, right? Mm-hmm. I think they burned through that. They figured out real quickly, not like wishy-washy, not like, can I put one big show behind it and is it successful? And is that about all shows I put behind it that are big? Or is it just this audience? Like what happens? They just said, let's do it with all of them. And the hard part is, is that a lot of their content acquisitions ended up being not financially worth it when they made that decision, which 
is very tough, but imagine if we spent the next three to five years trying to answer this question and all of these content companies building and building and building, and then all of them across the ecosystem, not just Spotify acquisitions, yes. you know, crumbled like that. That that would be hard. Now, right now, it looks incredibly depressing that Spotify spent all this money and then a year or two or three later just wiped the the slate on it. That That's real tough. That's real tough for an industry to see, but the upswing after this will be better than if three years from now, 50% of all production companies had to reduce their size. Yeah. Hello, Prince Harry, Meghan Markle. <laughs> uh, there, that, I mean, again, that's an example of a huge amount of money. So if you think, I mean, it's great. Do you think there's positive, because I feel very positive about podcasting, obviously where, where's your crystal ball focusing then, particularly on this, advertising size do you think we're going to get this kind of ad free subscription model i noticed lots of podcasts uh like if you sign up for patreon you get an ad free version um i personally and i say this obviously is a show that is ad revenue supported so i would say this but gen genuinely i've never had a problem with podcast listening to an ad on a podcast it's just kind of becomes part of the show again whether it's programmatic or host read um never bothered me in the slightest it's just kind of like listening to the radio isn't it but i there is a sort of move towards this oh if you pay you don't get the ads kind of model as well i think it's a really interesting model and i think that it's appealing to some people for me like the ones that i subscribe to are it's not about the ad free it's about the extra content mm. uh it's about the early access that's really what's interesting to me ads i think like I, I don't know kind of ads basically anywhere else, right? I use ad block on my browsers. I pay for subscription services that don't have, um, uh, I pay for subscription services that don't do ads, ads in their feed for my video services. W one time we tried to save some money and like switch to like a standard Hulu with ads account. And I don't think we finished an entire episode before I upgraded back. So podcasting is really interesting thing about that is podcasting is one of the few areas that I do get ads if I'm listening to a new show. So I listen, I check it out. If it's a bad ad, I skip it and I judge the podcaster aggressively. If it's a good ad, I make a note of it. And what's interesting about podcasting and how these ads are targeted is they're targeted more in the household. So I love being in situations where I get an ad that's definitely not valuable to me, but it's super valuable to my wife. And my wife says, Brian, I got this problem. And I said, oh, my God, I just heard about this product. And it's always funny to be like that. It's just like, did you listen to it on a podcast? Yes, yes, I did. Mm -hmm. um, there's, I think the ad-supported market is really strong in podcasting. I think it's the easiest place to monetize. You can sign up for Spreaker and immediately put ads on there, Red Circle and immediately put ads on there, Podbean, same thing. All these solutions, day one, 10 people downloading your podcast, and there can be ads on those first 10 downloads if you work with the right partner on it. In YouTube and in these other areas, you have to hit these thresholds that Sounds Profitable has been pumping out content on YouTube, and I, I get it. It's not the most glamorous, the business of podcasting type stuff, but we're not going to be ready to monetize on YouTube in forever. And then that's not us monetizing, that's YouTube monetizing for us. So it's very interesting. I think I think ad supported will continue to be a key of podcasting, but I'm interested in seeing more of these grouped subscriptions. Realm is so interesting to me. Q code, all these production companies that cover a specific area, a specific type of content and say, for this flat rate, you get all these podcasts. I'll start exploring it more. Back to the bundle. But while we're talking about good ads, I want to thank Factor for supporting the show today. Now that we're in the thick of summer, you might be looking for wholesome, convenient meals to support sunny, active days. Factor, America's number one ready-to-eat meal kit, can help you fuel up fast with flavourful and nutritious ready-to-eat meals delivered straight to your door. You'll save time, eat well and stay on track reaching your goals. Factor offer delicious, flavour-packed options on the menu each week to fit a variety of lifestyles from keto to calorie smart, vegan and veggie and protein plus. Prepared by chefs and approved by dietitians, each meal has all the ingredients you need to feel satisfied all day long while meeting your goals. And if you're looking to mix it up, you can add protein to select vegan and veggie meals each week. There's loads of great stuff on the menu over at the Factor Meals website, and I'm, I'm kind of jealous I can't get it here in the UK yet. 
With Factor, you can rest assured you're making a sustainable choice. They offset 100% of their delivery emissions, source 100% renewable electricity for their production sites and offices, and feature sustainably sourced seafood in their meals. Head to factormeals.com slash addition50 and use code addition50 to get 50% off. That's code addition50 at factormeals.com slash addition50 to get 50% off. Thanks to Factor for sponsoring this show. We're back with Brian Barletta from the Research House Sounds Profitable, talking all things podcasts. Now, one thing you've highlighted in more recent research is this, how podcasting, you'll explain it better than me, is either going to go broadcast or digital. Explain what you meant by that in a recent piece you put out. Yeah, my focus was who do we have to prove ourselves to, right? If we're broadcast, we already have more data with IP address and user agents. So the the app and the device you're on and your your internet connection, cellular, household, or business, and the little bit of data we get from that. So if you compare that to broadcast television, broadcast radio, who just know their market and the estimate of people who are going to be available in those markets – we know far more than that. We know households, we know regions, we know businesses that are connecting and listening to these podcasts. It's really powerful. So I think, are we broadcast plus, right? We have all the benefits of broadcast, but we have way more data. Or are we digital minus? Like when you look at, there's been a substantial amount of people who have found the value in podcast advertising the same as what they did on Facebook. But it wasn't until Facebook lost the ability to show as much data with their pixel because of the degradation of third party cookies and mobile device IDs that Facebook became more of a black box like podcasting can seem sometimes. But those digital people that can get their head around the fact that we're not going to get cookie, we're not going to get mobile device ID, but you can get 1.5 to 3x return on investment by playing the same type of game you're playing on Facebook. That's that's the people we need to appeal to if we're digital minus. So it's it's kind of just picking which one we are when we represent it and who we talk to. When we talk about getting ad budgets, you have to go to a specific team. Getting the radio team to buy podcast ads, usually not a thing. That's the digital team that handles podcasts. Getting the digital team to move from connected television, which is incredibly hot right now and has tons of data, according to them, uh, and go to podcasting. Well, that's a tough sell when these people are all just trying to keep their jobs. Yes. And of course, the nice thing about podcast ads is the podcasters know their audience because you have a real relationship with your listeners. So I know my listeners are going to really enjoy Factor Mills. That's why they advertise on the show, for example. And, you know, and other podcast, whatever ads you listen to, often they're they they're related to the show and related to the audience in some way when as you say with the very important caveat done well and that's what's important and that works i think applies really to both programmatic and host red doesn't it yeah and, and i just want to be clear so um there, there's creative types of ads right there's mm-hmm. the host red you just did a host red ad there is the announcer red so or or producer right someone consistent with the show or the network sure. that is a voice that focuses on the ads is not the primary content deliverer i've heard lots of those on the athletic for example yeah i, I think a lot of um uh, journalism uh, focus content uh, tries to separate out the host from the endorsement. And I think that's really smart. Uh, public media like NPR and PRX really focus on that as well, which I think is really neat. And then the final one is announcer read. So in this situation, if I were to do your ad read, um, which definitely give me the copy at the end of this, I'm happy to help out too. That would be <laughs> fun. Um, <laughs> If I were to do the ad read, I'm an announcer. I'm an unaffiliated person with the show overall. I might be a guest, which is rare, but like the announcer is just talent doing an an ad that the brand has access to. So that's the creative side. But the delivery is baked in. If I say I really enjoy my iPhone, well, that's a baked in ad because we just put it in the content. There's no Mm -hmm. delivery mechanism that puts it in. Dynamic ad insertion is the idea that we say, and we'll be right back. And then in that space, we put a a pause that allows us to have the hosting platform say, is there a relevant ad to this episode, this user, this time of day, this geographical region, all of these different things, and insert it and build that person who hit download or hit play a unique MP3 different than the person sitting next to them. And then programmatic is just a little step further. It's instead of your hosting platform having the ad in it, you're simply saying there is an ad break here. 
does somebody else, here's the information about the request. Does a programmatic partner want to bid on this inventory and then the highest bidder gets the ad? Right. And you could hear a different ad every time you listen to the show. Someone listening to the same show as you might not hear the same advert, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, when you press play, you're progressively downloading the episode, or if you hit manual download or you auto download because yes, you're once following, you're downloaded, that's a different thing. Once yes. it's downloaded, it's there. But if, if five of us sat together with the exact same iPhone and the exact same app on the exact same Wi-Fi and hit play at the same time, it is incredibly possible that all of us would hear different ad loads. And what do you think is now they all have different benefits, these different kinds of adverts for the creators and actually the listeners, frankly. But what what direction do you think the industry is going? Are we looking more at that kind of dynamic way of doing it? Is that connection with the host still important and products there? And how how what way do you think we're going? What's proving most popular in your research? I think that the brands that got us to $2 billion are focused on host red endorsement. They find a lot of success with it. it uh, advertising is not the cool Mad Men-esque uh, space it used to be. It's a lot of A-B testing on Facebook and uh, Google search and all those things. It, it, it kind of can feel soulless sometimes. So giving the person buying the ads the ability to have a famous podcaster or an important person passionately talk about a product and see success from that is incredibly appealing. Those are the people who got us here, right? That's MailChimp, that's Squarespace, mm -hmm. all these names there. And a Squarespace, lot of them did cost per yes. acquisition, right? So cost per acquisition, instead of just a, a flat rate for thousand ad impressions, which is cost per million yep. or CPM, um, cost per acquisition is they, they make a, a percentage of the sale. So people are more motivated to sell it more passionately. Those are the people who got us here. I think those are the people that there's still uh, easily another billion dollars that they would like to spend, but they're struggling. I think for scale, we need those dynamic and programmatic solutions like Megaphone's Spotify ad network. Yeah. That is that is a uh, dynamic ad insertion solution that's handled locally by them as their own marketplace. Whereas programmatic like AdsWiz or um, uh, Triton Digital or any of these other partners out there, Art19, they all... Um, they all provide the ability for you to create your content and make it available to anybody you set up those relationships with or they set it up with. That's really powerful because partners like Spreaker, right? If you just sign up on Spreaker today, you can start monetizing. It might not be the $25 CPM that we see listed on Advertise Cast and Libsyn. That's a goal for host red endorse. You did the sale, you did the account management, you did the invoicing, you did the creative. Yeah, you get more cut there because you did more time. But as you get further down the line, someone else sells it for you, like Spotify Ad Network. Someone else sells it for you, like Programmatic. Those, there are more people doing more work and you ultimately do less work and get paid. So I think the future is going to be more automated and more distant from the host. I, but I don't think host red will go away. I think it will still be uh, probably 50% of the revenue in podcasting for the foreseeable future. Yeah, I always like to listen to um I'm always interested in the products that hosts I like are prepared, you know, happy to endorse. Yeah. Um we've talked a couple of times during this, you sort of mentioned downturns and that or hinted at those kind of things. Now I started the show and I'm very positively I'm determined to end it that way by because I think there's so much exciting room to grow within the podcast industry. I mean, some of the things you've laid out, for example, really lower the barrier to entry, um, which, which I think is great because, you know, you someone might find a show, relatively small show that they just love. And that's that's great. Um, but you, you said you've talked about that downturn and I still think there's a lot of good in the podcast industry, not just because of that uh, room to go that I've talked about, but because it just seems to be the most positive aspect of media. I mean, when we were talking off, I joked that I'd rather be in podcasting than print media, which is a yeah. rather, ex rather extreme way of looking at it. But I, I'm not wrong to think there's a lot going right in podcasting, am I? Oh, no, I completely agree. So I think one of the reasons Sounds Profitable has really hit its stride in podcasting is that we cover how other things in media and advertising impact podcasting. We do a, a channel for our partners uh, where we update that daily. And then we um, do a weekly recap called The Download where we talk about it, what you need to know in 10 minutes or less on the business of podcasting. 
all of that has been really powerful to help remind people that the the issues that we're seeing in content people are seeing in tv and in film and the downturn in content creation is is absolutely there i mean people are being affected by the writer's strike and all of these things and then on the advertising side we are not unique like i think that our drop-off is probably less severe than a lot of other industries yeah. there are entire channels that are just not doing well but they don't have the coverage and the focus and the zeitgeist i guess the to for the podcasting just to to just get everybody's attention like it is a newsworthy topic to talk about podcast failure right now because People took big swings, but what we're seeing is ad revenue is returning back to where it was. There's a little bit of growth on there. There are companies that who overshot a little bit, I think redid their numbers during a boom post pandemic or post yes. the start of the pandemic that I think that was a really bad call and they're starting to suffer for those. And that's a bummer, but I think there's a lot of companies who played it lean, didn't expand to everything on there. And as we hear more and more that there are less podcasts released every day and people are scared about that, to me, that's less clutter because I don't think that we're talking about less, um, you know, top 10% podcasts coming out. And maybe we are. Maybe we're talking a slight reduction in the number of episodes that they release in a year or the number of series that shop puts out total. We've seen that. But I think a lot of this drop off is people who thought that this was a way to make money or thought that it was a way to kill time even during the pandemic aren't interested in it anymore it, it was fun it served its purpose and it's done it's like national pile oh, like national uh uh um, novel writing month uh -huh. right they they wrote their novel they moved on and that's okay so i think right now the people that are here have the biggest opportunity if they can weather it and you really just need to determine is this a job and a career and a business and you're going to invest in it and so or is it a hobby and a passion and if you separate the two of those and you don't and one needs to make money treat it like a job which sometimes it's hard to love your job and if, if the other one's a passion don't let the money dissuade you from the passion have fun with it well i certainly love this job and doing this show but i i want to just wrap up by saying what you've like you know outlined to me sounds more less like a crisis and more maybe reversion to the meme uh, mean after a very extraordinary couple of years. And you're so right that we saw this across media, people signing up for tons of streaming services that they now realize they don't want because they can leave their homes. People listening to yeah. a lot more podcasts because all they could do was walk and listen to podcasts. All those things are true. I just feel that podcasting because of the flexible nature of where you can consume it, is probably in one of the best positions to stay strong as the the mean for podcasting i think can be quite strong still yeah i think the big thing to keep in mind though is because it is open because it is so accessible because it's flexible on demand when everybody wants it or whenever that person wants it and it can be consumed anywhere, right? You're going for a walk, really hard to watch HBO Max or Max, yes. just Max now while you're walking down the street. Real easy to listen to a podcast about Batman. Um, I think I think that podcasting has a lot of opportunity then, and I'm really excited to see where we rebound from all of this. But I think I think we're set up for success. I really truly do. I think audio is a very powerful medium. I think it'll continue to be more monetized, but I think that people right now are trying to reestablish what their life and routine is. I'll tell you, more people have AirPods in their ears mm -hmm. listening to audio of some sort that I see out and about than looking at their phone and staring at video content. And because nobody can own podcasting, because it's open, what we're going to find in this next phase is we collectively are going to have to come back come together to advertise the space. Spotify is not going to advertise it the same way. Apple Podcasts does not advertise it the same way. There's not as much money and fanfare behind them promoting it. They'll promote their overall solution and that includes that, but they won't promote podcasting. So one of the initiatives Tom and I have for next year is the equivalent of a gut milk campaign, but for podcasting. Right. And whether that's you want to advocate yeah. for the industry as a whole. 
Exactly, exactly. And whether that's at a uh, content creation or a media summit or anything like or, or Cannes Film Festival, Conan O'Brien with his headphones around his neck and a milk mustache that says got podcasts. This is why I'm not the creative, by the way, uh -huh. um, that like these are the types of things that we can really just do collectively or at an ad tech conference or advertising conference, having a panel and a session all about why podcast advertising works with those celebrities who will charge an arm and a leg to show up on TV, but are incredibly affordable in these places. And then showing about the, the core podcasters, people like yourself, who your audience, I bet converts incredibly well for your advertisers and the people who listen there, because people know that if you're going to say something and you're going to endorse it, well, they can yell directly at you if they don't like it. So you're <laughs> not really going to take those risks because it's not that much money. Uh, please don't yell at me. I like, I do love you listening <laughs> to feedback, but please don't listen to me. I guess my final question for you, Brian, what speed do you listen to podcasts at? Oh, okay. Um, so I, I'm going to talk about audiobooks first. Audiobooks, <clears throat> I have capped at 1.3. My wife is at like two and I don't know how she does it. No, By the way, the book she read, yeah, books she read, she mostly read them, but every now and then she'll do an audiobook. Um, for podcasts, I mostly listen to at one X. I think that I burned out of podcasts that I don't want to listen to at normal speed. I like their music and sound design. I listen to a lot of uh, Dungeons and Dragons style actual play podcasts. I listen to uh -huh. a lot of audio drama. Um, Midnight Burger, got a shout out to my absolute favorite podcast, Midnight Burger, which Tom Webster is in uh, in one of the most recent episodes of awesome. uh, Young Leaf on Midnight Burger. And yeah, I... I, it's 1x speed. I can't do it. Okay. I'm glad you said that because that's what I listen to it as well. Brian, thank you so much for being on the show. Just let people know where they can keep up with you and Sounds Profitable's work. Absolutely. So you can find all of our stuff at soundsprofitable.com. Our research is not gated. You can download it without having to sign up for anything, but we would love for you to sign up for our newsletter. We release on Wednesday and Friday every week. Wednesday is more of a thought piece to motivate the entire space or talk about and educate how things work. And Friday is more of a recap of what happened in the world of advertising and podcasting and media. So you can find that all at soundsprofitable.com. And my name is Brian Barletta, spelled with a Y, but Brian at Sounds Profitable will get you a direct email to me. And I would love to talk to all of you. Um, I get those emails and always find something to uh, think about or even write a newsletter about. So I'm always grateful. I'm at Charlotte A. Henry on the Twitters, on threads, which is a thing we're doing now. And basically any social media, it's either at Charlotte A. Henry or at Shah A. Henry, of course, head over to theedition.net because you get the blog there, you can listen to the podcast there, you get all sorts, and you can also sign up for the newsletter or go directly to newsletter.theedition.net to sign up. Brian, thank you once again for joining me, and I'll see you all next week. Okay.